rushing to eat and, and to get here on time. And so thank you for being here. Um, my name is Cameron Brewer. I am the uh, chair of ULI Oklahoma. Uh, ULI is, uh, it stands for the Urban Land Institute. It is an organization that nationally has been around for uh, close to 100 years at this point. Um, we have a, a district council here in Oklahoma uh, that we uh, call ULI Oklahoma. Um, and it has been around for 12 years at this point. There are 53 district councils across the nation. Um, ULI is a group, uh, it's a membership organization that basically uh, looks at uh, best practices in land use and uh, how to use those best practices to create and sustain thriving communities worldwide. What that means, there's a lot that uh, is under that umbrella. A lot of that relates to development, real estate development, and the impacts that has, um, positive and negative. Uh, we, we try to look at the, again, the best practices side, so the positive impacts of real estate development and, and bringing that to our members. Um, here in Oklahoma, uh, across uh, the, to a corner of Northwest Arkansas, we have 450 members, but um, about 325 of our members are here in the Oklahoma City metro. And so it's really uh, primarily based here in the, in the metro area. Um, I want to, uh, again, thank you all for being here. This is uh, such a, an honor and privilege to be on stage to discuss this topic. Um, obviously, this is a topic that has been discussed for many years and uh, ULI is, uh, has been a part of that conversation to some extent, but um, frankly, we are just entering uh, a, a part uh, into this conversation that's been ongoing and, 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 and we want to play our part. Uh, today, we have three wonderful speakers that are um, gonna speak to the macro, micro, and then even local levels of, uh, of food security and uh, they are experts in their field um, coming from uh, both coasts, uh, from Baltimore, uh, Southern California, and then um, uh, Dr. Bryce Lowry, who is uh, here at the University of Oklahoma. So um, I want to first thank um, our uh, sponsors of ULI Oklahoma. Um, we have a number of sponsors that uh, are annual sponsors year in and year out. I, I, I see it. Perfect. Um, and uh, so, yeah, these are our annual sponsors. And um, continuing on to this next page, um, our sponsorship has been growing annually. Um, we have, uh, it's on an automatic timer, that's what's going on. So, um, the, and then to, for today's uh, program, these are our uh, sponsors specific to this program. We want to give a big thanks to Lynn Institute as a presenting sponsor. Um, in addition to our supporting sponsors, Oklahoma City Health Task Force, uh, there are a number of organizations that make up that, make up that task force and um, also want to give a thanks to our contributing sponsors and community partners. And so with that, I'm going to uh, turn the uh, mic over uh, to Karen Waddell with the Lynn Institute and uh, she's going to say a few words about the organization. Thank you and welcome. On behalf of the Lynn Institute, our outstanding staff, our board of directors, and the hundreds of partners, individuals, and organizations that we get to work with, we welcome you. And I'm so excited to see all of the faces in this room. I know you all bring many talents, many passions, and many interests, and many areas that we can support our wonderful neighbors and friends in Northeast Oklahoma City. The Lynn Institute is actually two organizations. One is the for-profit organization that does clinical research. We're not here to talk about them today, but the Lynn Institute um, in 2012 identified the most vulnerable population in Oklahoma as being Northeast Oklahoma City, our great friends in those three zip codes. And we started a three and a half year program to complete research, to pull together everything we could, all the friends we could. We interviewed hundreds of people, identified what the community, what they told us they wanted, what they told us they needed. 
Then we looked at health and assets, we looked at history and assets, quantitative and qualitative research, and from that, we identified many items for improvement, as you can imagine. Some of those, you're not gonna be surprised, were transportation and education and economy and health and overall lifestyle well-being. But in the middle of all of those, what we found is the, the food insecurities underlying almost everything. We determined that about 40% of the 27,000 people in those three zip codes had at least um, only two ways of getting food, and one was either walking or getting someone else to take them to a food resource. We identified 32 gas stations or convenience stores um, in Northeast Oklahoma City for food. We identified a gaggle of what I would call fast food residents and restaurants and some, and some nice restaurants. And then we identified only one full service grocery store. And tragically, as we all know today, there are no full service grocery stores. As you hear the today's speakers, and we're so honored to have these three people with us today, and, and Councilwoman Nice and her leadership, we're so honored for ULI and all the things that they've done. Listen carefully and absolutely become excited, not discouraged, not concerned about or overwhelmed, but realize that these are all areas that working with people and with each other, we can absolutely help. I would remind you not only of the words of Margaret Mead, which were to identify that never underestimate what a group of committed people can do, but most importantly to know, yet yes, there's much to do, but nobody can do everything, but everyone in this room can do something. Thank you so much for being here. And before I introduce the councilwoman, I um, would be remiss if I did not thank uh, our programs team that put this together. Um, we had a number of individuals who uh, brought together a, a many of our community partners um, across the city to discuss many of the topics. Um, many of the topics that we'll be discussing today and that we have been over the last two days are not easy topics to discuss, um, and that's something that uh, I have been uh, very conscious of and our group has been very conscious of, but there are also topics that um, we, uh, we do not need to be shy about talking about as well. So um, I want you to keep that in mind as uh, the audience today and, um, and, and, and take that in, into consideration. Um, but uh, back to our sponsor, or sorry, our programs team. I um, want to take, uh, thank uh, Michelle McBeth. Uh, she's our ULI staff member. Um, she's been instrumental in, in, in making this happen. Uh, Mark Zitzau, uh, ULI Programs Chair. Uh, Mariana Adams with uh, Progress OKC. Um, Councilwoman Nice, who has been uh, also instrumental in bringing together the right people in the room. Apollo Woods with Black, uh, uh, OKC Black Eats. And many others who contributed to the conversation. So um, thank you to all of them. Um, without further ado, it's an honor and a privilege to, uh, to introduce Councilwoman Nikki Nice. Um, Councilwoman Nice was elected to the Oklahoma City City Council November 6, 2018, so just over uh, one year now representing Ward 7, which is the ward we're currently in. Uh, she was the 10th woman and second woman of color elected to the, to the council. Um, she's a fourth generation Oklahoman. Uh, she went to the Millwood Public School Districts, um, Northeast High School, and so um, she is uh, born and bred in this area. and. Uh, and so if there's anybody who's qualified to talk about this uh, topic, it's her, um, because she has, uh, she has lived it in the area that she grew up in. Um, she's received a number of awards. Uh, over the um, last six months since becoming chair, uh, Councilwoman Ice and I have gotten to know each other uh, much better. A lot of that's been over the last few days as well. And uh, I can tell you she's absolutely committed um, to this effort and um, and bringing many of these issues to light, not only uh, bringing them to light, but uh, putting them in action, which is um, going to be where we're going to be wrapping up today, is, um, is looking at what's next. And so, um, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce Councilwoman Nice. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Ooh. I'll try that one more time. That parking lot is full too, so for that in this room, we can try that again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Much better, the sun is shining, 
bright outside. Um, so it's, it's a blessing to at least see what's happening and to be a part of the process in our communities. So what we're going to do is start with a video for you to watch for a couple of minutes, and then um, I'll be back to present uh, what's happening as far as 73111 area is concerned. What determines how long we'll live? Is it what we do? Is it who we are? Actually, when it comes to predicting how long you'll live, your zip code is more important than your genetic code. Here's how this works. Meet Deb and Maria. They both have jobs, they're around the same age, they're both married, and they both have two kids. Deb lives in A-Town, while Maria lives in Beeville, less than one mile away. They're similar in so many ways, but here's the thing. On average, residents of Beeville will die more than 15 years sooner than the residents of A-Town. Why? Because where you live is about more than just your address. It's about your opportunities. For example, Deb and Maria's access to healthy options is really different. In A-Town, Deb's family is surrounded by healthy food options, including farmer's markets, specialty shops, and grocery stores. The air in A-Town is cleaner and fresher, and there are lots of safe, clean parks where Deb can exercise and her children can play. A-Town has good public schools for Deb's kids and easy access to emergency and preventive health care. On the other hand, Beeville has broken, badly lit sidewalks and the parks are unsafe. The air is filled with truck exhausts from the nearby highway. And for food options, Maria's only choices are Beeville's many liquor stores, fast food places or convenience stores. The schools in Beeville are overcrowded and undersupported. And even if Maria can get her kids into better schools far away, she needs to figure out how to get them there without access to a car. So for Maria, having to juggle so much to find healthy options can be an overwhelming source of chronic stress, which is a serious health risk factor. In fact, for all the residents of Beeville, chronic stress drives health problems like obesity, diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. How did A-Town and Beeville get so different? Well, in many cases in cities and towns across California, the root cause was racial and economic discrimination. Over the generations, poor white people and people of color were pushed to less desirable parts of town. Where banks refused to lend money, businesses left, jobs too, schools declined, and the neighborhood crumbled. Everyone who could move away did. And what's more, when communities like A-Town and Beeville are so unequal, Beeville isn't the only one that suffers. Because it turns out that not only is your zip code a predictor of how long you'll live, so is what country you live in. Countries with the greatest income inequality have the lowest life expectancy. So even Americans like Deb, who are white, insured, college educated and upper income die younger than their peers in other countries. In fact, our life expectancy is 43rd in the world, and that number is slipping. In the end, our biggest health risk may actually be inequality, and extreme inequality hurts us all. So what do we do? Well, if we're all going to be healthier, we don't just need to help the folks in Beeville beat the odds. We need to change the odds for everyone. And that's what we're doing. There's a movement happening. We're Californians. We don't follow. We lead. We are building the power to make health happen in communities across the state. We are coming together to build one California, a smarter, more inclusive and equitable state that creates health and opportunity for all of us. Join us. To learn more, visit buildinghealthycommunities.org. 
And that's uh, an example of what California has done to present um, to their community and their residents about what it looks like with the community uh, when you have a, a town in Beeville where even those numbers, and I know when, as I watched this yesterday, I said, oh my gosh, that's Northeast Oklahoma City altogether. Um, same exact what we're looking at. Although we see some, some great strides when we're looking at sidewalks being placed in the community, we're looking at uh, a lot of other infrastructure things that are happening, we still see a lot of disinvestment in the community. And we still see those numbers. Um, I've seen numbers from 5.9 years less as far as the life expectancy all the way up to 18 years less in stories. So again, as we're looking at uh, the statistics, residents of Northeast Oklahoma City, as you see, that life expectancy. So the average life expectancy in Oklahoma City County, it ranges from 63.8 years to 81.7 years. And as we're looking at just the 73111 zip code, which is with policy that where we are trying to target and do things better and different, our uh, life expectancy is 68.98 years. So let's look at Northeast Oklahoma City and 73111. And some of you may have seen this presentation before, um, so I hope you get something different if you had not before. But as we're looking, and we're looking at 73111, here's what we know. Northeast Oklahoma City has the highest morbidity rate in every major disease in comparison to other Oklahomans. More people purchase food items outside of Northeast Oklahoma City than within. Obesity and smoking rates are higher than Oklahoma in the nation. There's a significantly lower life expectancy as we just talked about and discussed. Highest obesity rate, all cancer mortality is greatly increased and breast cancer is two times higher. So when we're looking at even breast cancer, Breast Cancer Awareness Month was in the month of October. And statistics show one in every eight women will be diagnosed with breast, breast cancer. So we're doubling that in just one zip code of 7,000 people. Two, every two women of eight will be diagnosed with breast cancer. That's an alarming number when we're looking at that for our community. Current places where Northeast residents shop, as you kind of heard that before from Ms. Waddell, 22 restaurants including fast food options, 13 gas and convenience stores. And I will say in 73111, there are only seven fast food restaurants. And uh, locally, probably about a month ago, there was a news report um, from one of our local stations saying there was an abundance of fast food stores. Seven doesn't seem like an abundance to me. Now, as we look at grocery stores in just this one zip code, we have zero. And I wanna make it clear for everyone in this room today, when we're looking at what a full service grocery store looks like in our community or in any community, we have not had one. So uh, reports and people are saying the only full size grocery store closed in Northeast Oklahoma City, it was not, and I repeat, it was not a full service grocery store. A full service grocery store, in my opinion, you have the butcher shop, you have the deli, you have a pharmacy, you have all of these needs that can be met at a grocery store. In this particular store, if you have been shopping there, we know they did not provide all of those things to the community. In the store that does exist, it does not provide all of those things to the community. So again, I think it's important for us to, to know as we speak about what's really happening in the community that we are accurate with the information as it pertains to Oklahoma City, Northeast Oklahoma City, especially those are most vulnerable in the 73111 zip code. So here's what exists right now. Small box discount stores for this same zip code. We have three family dollar stores one located on the uh, 2036 Northeast 23rd Street, which is literally right across the street from where this, the grocery store closed. And from just history and looking through some old pictures, I found that this once upon a time was a grocery store itself, was a Safeway. We also have 51, 5801 North Martin Luther King Avenue and 3400 North Kelly. As far as Dollar Trees, there is one in existence in this same zip code, 1116 Northeast 36th Street. 
So here is what we are looking at. As I told you, we have one existing store that is in Northeast Oklahoma City, although it's right outside of the 73111 zip code. It is literally probably 10 to 11 blocks from 23rd and MLK. And this is the Sunshine Market, which we still affectionately call Otwells. And it's also uh, located at 1149 North MLK. And their hours of operation, as you can see, are 7 a.m. until 9 p.m. But here's what we're looking at when we look at this store. And let me also I'll advise you as far as the history of this location, this has been a dedicated store location, if I'm not mistaken, since the 1970s. And as you can see, uh, in a lot of aspects, this store still looks the same. Here's more pictures. And I, I, I will say as well, although traffic has picked up a little bit, they have gone through so many different owners um, that they are providing better options, but still not the best options that our community should have. But we are grateful that they can provide something. Here's a family dollar store that I mentioned that was literally across the street from that closed store that we have. It's 2036 Northeast 23rd Street. And um, I frequent these stores too because they're, I have needs just like everyone else. Um, and when I go in there to purchase things or, or look and see what I can purchase, this is what I, I have found that our community is also subjected to. This is the frozen dairy and grocery section. As you can see, it's almost completely empty. This is the Dollar Tree, 1116 Northeast 36th Street, which is 36 and Kelly. And as you can see, um, they have a little bit more options available, but I think it really depends, honestly, on the time of the month um, and the time of the week if they get their deliveries in time for you to see stocked shelves of processed food. So what would help 73111? More access to fresh fruits and vegetables, more healthy food choices at restaurants, grocery stores. Uh, folks have said they want more grocery stores. They want available fresh fruits. Additional stores that carry fresh and inexpensive produce is also needed. Access to fruits and vegetables. Better grocery stores with choices and education. And this is from a study uh, that we had that the Lynn Institute, just gathering some of that information from some of those focus groups. And one of the things that we found, uh, or I read that was an alarming, alarming conversation piece to me was that as far as health outcomes are concerned, in this survey that was done, 89% of the respondents said that in general, Northeast Oklahoma City is not a physically, mentally, or healthy community. 89% of people who live, breathe, and walk in this community every day do not feel that they are mentally, physically, or healthy in this community. And as you see, as grocery stores leave, so do other independent businesses in the community, which is also uh, where we talk about the disinvestment when it comes to the different areas of Northeast Oklahoma City. Small box stores have on average about eight to nine people on staff. And if you're like me, sometimes you just need to go grab something, you go to the Dollar Tree, you go to the Family Dollar, you may see one, two, maybe three, at max four people working in those stores at, at one given time in the afternoon. Uh, I know once, I, I've actually been in a store, I, only seen, I have only seen one person in the store operating that, at that time. Independent stores employ an average of 14 people. So when we're talking about independent stores, we're talking more about the Otwell's grocery store. And even that day that I went in this store, uh, in particular when I took these photos, I counted about no more than four to five people that were working there that day, including the butcher who was in the, in the back. And one of the conversations that we know when it comes to small box discount stores is, there is a lack of local oversight. So I, I will say, I remember when I, I first got elected into office last year, uh, there was an incident that occurred at the Dollar Tree, 
and the employees there did not have heat in the store. And, and the conversation came where a pastor was calling me out, asking me why I wasn't providing heat for their store, when in fact, the prob pro problem and the responsibility was on the property owner and also the corporate office of Dollar General. So that's why I say it's, it's very hard to have local oversight on how these stores operate and what happens. And then fast forward to what happened this summer in the store on Northeast 10th, there was a family dollar that this summer that did not have air conditioning. And the food and the chocolate and everything was melting in the store because it was so hot. And they literally had to shut the store down because someone called um, the ethics commission or the work commission, whoever it was, uh, and those people can't work in those conditions. So again, this talks about that local oversight piece. So as we're talking about the healthy neighborhood overlay district for 73111, this, it affects about 7,000 residents that live within the area. And this purpose is to initiate the rezoning for properties that are partially or wholly located within that zip code to establish a healthy neighborhood overlay, which will provide requirements for the dispersal of locations of small box discount stores unless they have a pharmacy or provide at least 500 square feet of retail space dedicated to the sale of fresh meats, fruits, and vegetables. And for the boundaries of 73111, we are looking at Northeast 16th on the south and Wilshire Boulevard on the north between North Kelly and I-35. So all of this happened, here's the background. It happened on May, that's when our city council adopted this ordinance, declaring the 180 day moratorium on the acceptance of applications. So basically we said, let's, let's pause, let's take a look at this to see how this is affecting our communities, especially our communities within Northeast Oklahoma City. On October 22nd, we did ask our city council to adopt an emergency to extend that moratorium to 269 days as we work through the healthy neighborhood overlay. And the timeline for our, our overlay currently, as it stands, uh, we did have the introduction at our last city council meeting. Um, which was the second, and we will have a council hearing, another hearing, a public hearing that will take place next Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. If you wanna come, please do. You have any comments, please make them. And we will adopt this in January. So we will not have a city council meeting on the 31st, but we will have one on January the 7th. So here is what we have done uh, in the meantime, the health task force in neokcfood.com. With the health task force, it, it is a, a whole lot of partners and I'm so grateful for everyone when we said let's start in May, let's come up with a task force because we're gonna have to address this holistically. How can we do that? Let's bring people that we know that are doing the work to the table to find out what we can do better or help us address the need because at the time, we knew we had uh, at least a while as we were working through what we needed to do. Unfortunately, uh, with the sudden closing of the store without uh, notice to the community, we had to work a little faster to do the things that we needed to do. So I am thankful for Regional Food Bank, Oklahoma City County Health Department, Restore OKC, um, OU Medicine, Lynn Institute, American Red Cross, Filling Tummies, Community Health Centers of Oklahoma, Oklahoma City Housing Authority, Bonnie's Helping Hands, National Women in Ag Association, OKC Black Eats, and as far as our Northeast, OKCfood.com, we also have a list of, of food resources, there's events and also transportation. So one of the things that we were able to implement immediately was this Embark Grocery Shuttle. And this was for us to meet the immediate need because we knew with the suddenness of that closing, there was going to be a transportation need. So we were able to provide that literally the next day after that store closed. And currently we still do that. It's Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Pickup times are 10 a.m., 11 a.m., and noon, and it leaves from Ralph Ellison Library. And I will say, uh, unfortunately, 
we hope we would have a great ridership, but we understand there are a lot of circumstances that come with why people aren't riding. But I would hope to think that others are relying on neighbors and creating that neighborly atmosphere, if possible, and creating a new relationship if they hadn't. But again, uh, as we work through those challenges and, and how we can be better at providing that transportation, we want to continue to talk to the community. So other efforts, and then I'll be through and introduce our next speaker. Uh, other efforts, as you have heard, we have a brand new homeland that is coming to Northeast Oklahoma City. It will be located on the corner of Northeast 36 and Lincoln. And we are excited about them bringing a 30,000 square foot brand new store, brand new full service grocery store, which our community has not seen in over 26 years. And they have not built a brand new store since 2011. So this is something that they're going to do in our community for our residents. And also, as we're looking at the investment of what this looks like for our community as well, we talked about opportunity zones, we talked about minority investment, and that's why I ask that we were very intentional as I talked to our city staff and those who work with our economic development to ensure that we had people that actually look like the community invest in what this store can bring. And we are working through that investment piece, but we are thankful again for the efforts of, of Homeland, also the o city of Oklahoma City, and there's still a lot of work to be done. But I wanted to show what the policy looks like right now of what we're doing uh, to meet that need in 73111. So next, as you see in your agenda, you're gonna hear from some wonderful folks who have dedicated their time to be in Oklahoma City with us. And I'm excited to introduce our, our next speaker, Dr. Lavana Blair Lewis from University of Southern California. And she was born and raised in, in Northeast Oklahoma City. And she, oh yeah, her sister's in the back. Her, her family's in the back. And I told, yes, I told Dr. Lewis, I said, I just want you to know your sister said, my sister's coming. I said, well, I am so excited. I said, I did not know that was your sister. But now that I see you both, I can definitely tell you are sisters. Uh, but I know you're extremely proud of your sister and the work that she's done. And we are proud to introduce her as a product of Northeast Oklahoma City to talk about the amazing work she's been able to do in California. Please welcome Dr. Lewis. <laughs> So can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Maybe it's this. Is yours still on? Okay, so no more humming at the moment. Okay, so... Um, I'm Lavonna Lewis, and a couple of things I do when I introduce myself, I, um, I let people know that um, I'm very clear that I exist. Um, the first reason is to... Oh, it in a... This one's off. Maybe I need to cut this one off. All right, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, so, as I was saying, I exist on the planet for two reasons. Uh, number one, I exist to make the invisible visible. When I first got started in this work um, in Los Angeles 20 years ago in, in Southeast Los Angeles, it was very clear that uh, people would drive through Los Angeles and not really see Los An Southeast Los Angeles, much like I saw when we were uh, going through uh, Northeast Oklahoma City. Um, the second reason I exist on the planet is that I'm very comfortable making other people uncomfortable. Because um, when you talk about issues of justice, when you talk about issues of privilege, when you talk about issues of racism, it makes people uncomfortable. But I've decided that's not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. So the reason I'm here today is, as you've already heard, that I'm a... Um, 
long-term resident, born and raised in Northeast Oklahoma City, uh, 73117 zip code. Um, and, but I'm here today to talk about a 20-year uh, research journey that I've been on with my colleague David Sloan at the University of Southern California, Saul Price School of Public Policy. And we got interested in the issue of food justice because we saw from a, from a planning and a public health perspective, people were very comfortable um, demonizing people for the choices that they were making without a full appreciation for the choices that are available. And so this idea of trying to go into communities and really begin to get a better sense of what's accessible is what drives our research. And so we want to talk a little bit about each of those issues. And some of this will be colored by the conversations I've been privileged to, be sit, uh, to sit in in the last few days. I want to thank uh, ULI and uh, Councilwoman Nice. I want to thank the various folks, the elected officials and other other kind of community-based organizations that allowed us into your space to kind of talk about the work that you were doing and to hopefully elevate it because there are things going on right now that are invisible to people who live in the community and they need to be lifted up and they need it to be supported and we'll talk more about that. So just want to kind of talk about this issue of recognizing that look, um, maybe there was a time when people cooked most of their food at home. I have people in my family that are very good cooks, but sometimes the, the evidence is that we're eating more and more food away from home. And so if that's true, then we have to start thinking about, well, what's readily available as we travel through these uh, kind of various spaces. This is an, uh, kind of a, uh, just kind of a difference. One of the things that we did in our research that I think is important is that we trained people in the community to assess the community. And so what you see are some of the things that, going back to uh, some of the pictures that you saw of South, uh, um, excuse me, Northeast Oklahoma City, same kind of thing that was going on in uh, parts of uh, South LA. And we compared ourselves, South Central LA, to uh, West LA, which is where UCLA is, and you know that's another school for another day. Um, but to understand, sorry, Lavana Lewis moment, uh, to just begin to kind of understand, again, what's available. Before, again, you can t ask people to take choices, you have to make sure those choices are available. So you're gonna hear, when we first got started with the research, the, the terminology was around food deserts. And this is taken from, I'm, I come from a public policy school, I teach as a public policy school, and this is from a public policy document. The fact that food deserts, which is kind of the research, is this idea that becoming part of legislation. Uh, I'm at a policy school because I think it's important for people to understand that Policy changes the rules of the game overnight. So we should be working to get things done right now to take care of immediate needs, but I'm glad to see the policies on the table because again, you may not like the policy, but if you want the money, you'll follow the policy guidelines. All right, so, um, so a food desert, just for those who you, you may not be familiar with the term, is a geographic area, particularly low-income neighborhoods and communities where access to affordable, quality, and nutritious foods is limited. The research also talks about food swamps. And the idea is like, it's not the access, it's not the lack of access to healthy foods, it's the unlimited access to unhealthy foods that's the problem. Or you're gonna hear a little bit about food apartheid and I will let my colleague define that. But the bottom line is this. This is a graph and each color, and we won't talk about the colors they chose for different categories of people, but the green stands for white, the brown is African American, Purple is, is Hispanic, and Asian is the yellow. Again, not very culturally sensitive. But I want you to understand something, no matter what you notice, one thing you'll notice very quickly is that the only population that has greater access to fast food than a grocery store is African Americans. And that is not just in Oklahoma, that is a global phenomenon. As the proportion of African Americans in the neighborhood goes up, Grocery store access goes down. I wonder how that happened. All right, so, Levana Lewis moment. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of these things that have been happening. Recognize again, it's like these things didn't happen overnight and we're not gonna fix it overnight, but that's no excuse for not trying. And so uh, one of the things that, um, that bothered me the most in my conversations with various folks in the community was the level of exhaustion. 
And I understand that exhaustion because I work in South LA. And there's a lot going on in South LA, but I don't use that as a reason to not try to elevate the community's agenda in South LA. And you've got an elected official who has energy for transformation, and I'm hoping that the people in this room get to that transformation. All right, so thank you. Thanks. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit of a few of these in, in more detail. And I'm going in and out, so I don't know what that's about. Uh, the first one, this is for those of you who are in public health. We have a long history of social, these kind of big campaigns. Um, you know, five a day, don't, you know, quit smoking. The evidence was, you know, those really targeted things weren't very um, effective. All right, the second thing we can talk about, I don't know. So, can you hear me? No, nope. no. Nope. Yeah, I'm not just dreaming. All right, so, uh, you gotta, I mean, again, you have to keep your sense of humor because if you don't, then the burnout is real. Because trying to get people to care about places that they have the luxury of driving through can wear you out. All right, so um, gone, recognizing again, it's like, look, we're not having the kinds of gains just in terms of individual markets, but begin to be, begin more targeted in terms of the marketing. So something like, you know, every time you go to the restaurant, wouldn't it be nice if you actually knew the difference between, you know, that nice salad and that, you know, Big Mac fries and calories and how much you're eating, if you just knew it, would you make a different decision? It's called a point of decision problem. Salad or Big Mac? Well, if you choose the Big Mac, if the menu count is there, you can't say that you didn't know. But if it's not there, you can. And that's the difference. Are, you, are we putting information in people's hands in easy to reach fashion? I want to talk more about those last elements because, again, I'm at a policy school because we realized that policy changes the rules of the game overnight. And so we decided that the focus of our work should really be on how do you transform the, the food environment, the physical activity environment, through kind of environmental and public policy. And that's what I'm gonna be kind of sharing, some of this uh, success in terms of what we've done in South LA. And so just to give you some examples, what is policy change? Is any change in the formal or informal rules or regulations that govern our collective life, it may be organizational, local, state, regional, national, or international. National policy was putting food deserts in legislation. Local policy can be a health overlay that says, look, if you're gonna develop here, you have to think differently about what you're gonna do on this, in this particular place. Organizationally, it can be you know, having a, um, uh, apples and oranges and bananas available for people as opposed to donuts. Um, sorry, Luana Lewis moment. Uh, what is environmental change? It is any change in the physical or built environment that influences our behavioral choices again, and our health directly. To understand, again, you walk through spaces not being mindful of all the, in, all the messages that are just being inundated and targeted towards you uh, as you walk through those spaces. Just think about the things that you see when you walk into a grocery store, the kinds of things that you see before you ever enter that space. Again, trying to get people more aware of the impact that those kinds of things have. So AABLH stands for African Americans Building a Legacy of Health. And that's what in 1999 we developed as our kind of community action plan for how do we begin to deal with same kind of issues that, you have in, uh, that we have in Northeast Oklahoma, higher burdens of diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity. And again, just think about it. I think what, what really got my attention was that with Social Security, you literally have people paying into a system for decades, which on that graph that you saw about Oklahoma meant that they might actually get benefits back for less than a year. And is that fair? If we're gonna die early, let's give us some of that money back early. Sorry, LaVonna Lewis moment. All right, sorry, sorry. So this is, this is from the, and it really is talking about a community-based 
process. And I don't mean community as a co-signer, I mean community as a partner. We didn't go into the community telling them what they should do. We said, what do you want to do and how can we come up with something that's the best way of getting there? Right? Because once people have buy-in on something, they're much more likely to put in some equity of their own to actually get it done. And so we, again, we're about change. I mean, so want to make it very clear that this whole conversation is about change because the status quo decision-making has left Northeast Oklahoma City uh, behind for decades. And I'm assuming that you're here because you're sick and tired of that. Sorry, Lavana Lewis moment. All right. So as I said earlier, before you get mad at people about the choices that they're making, find out what choices are available. So we went into markets. We went into restaurants, we went into convenience stores, we went into gas stations, we went into liquor stores because if you sell fruit, you can be considered a market. We went into it to talk about what was available. Again, in South LA and compared to West LA. And I would encourage those of you who are trying to make similar comparisons in, in this community, get, get people in a van and drive them from 23rd and Martin Luther King to the other side of Robinson or Classen and ask them how is this possible that these kinds of things can exist with, within such close proximity when we're talking about the same state, same city. All right, so we wanted to not just collect information, data is power. And so in, instead of people just talking about, well, you have to get people to think about something different before they can ask for something different. Right, we, went, we, we, pin, we trained the community to do the assessments of the markets and the other venues. And until you see mold and brown bananas in your neighborhood and then go on the other side of town and see that that's not what's going on, you might be okay with that. Or maybe you're fortunate enough that you're not locked into what's available in Northeast Oklahoma City and you can drive out. But if you're leaving people behind in doing that, are you okay with that? And so this is, this is about an agenda, taking data, writing letters, community meetings, participating in city council, planning meetings, other kinds of things that let people know, look, things aren't the same and we want somebody to do something about it. And this is going to, that, that the, the little kind of a block and tackle picture that you saw earlier, this is what it's become. It's about equity. You shouldn't have to work so hard in Northeast Oklahoma City just to live a healthy life. When other people in other parts of the city take health for granted. All right, so it's about equity. We're not saying that, you know, we don't, we don't believe that, you know, a riding tide lifts our boats, but right now I'm just concerned about my boat. All right, um, the change efforts, community campaigns. Again, this is about community energy, right? I think that elected officials understand a, a lot of things, but two things that we saw were very clear with some of our elected officials. They understood the resource question and they understood the numbers question. Maybe I don't have a big checkbook, but if I've got 100 people that are with me in this effort, other people need to know about it. And so community mobilization is important to try to get people to, again, think about how we might leverage some of our collective power. Much like um, um, Northeast Oklahoma City, we have a fast food, we had a moratorium uh, overlay that started with a moratorium on fast food. South LA has a different problem than Northeast Oklahoma City, and that has to do with land. Southeast Los Angeles is very, very dense. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people in those spaces, and so finding pieces of land for significant development are hard to do. That's not true in Northeast Oklahoma City. The, the property is available, and so we're hoping that changes will be made to kind of move the needle. And so incentivizing people. I mean, that's the carrot. In policy, how do you dangle something in people's faces to make it more attractive to them? You give them incentives. And, and, and part of what we were doing was giving incentives to people to come in to provide healthy food retail. The ICO is the stick. 
well, we're going to keep bad options out. If we can't get the good ones in, at least let's preserve real estate long enough so we can bring a healthy option in. And so policy, again, this started off as, again, just the moratorium. Now, for those of you who are in planning, the overlays, the general plan updates, there is now a health element for South LA, which says if you're going to do development in, house, in South LA, you have to take health into account, part of health being uh, physical activity and restaurants. I just want to end with some, some, a few more examples to understand that I think it's important to recognize that this is an all hands on deck kind of a effort. I think it's great that, that the, the, the grocery store is coming and that's what we started fighting for in Southeast LA. But we got other resources to come too and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those other resources. Some of you may have heard of store convergence or market makeovers. If you've just got small local shops, then maybe you can subsidize the transformation of some of those shops to make it easier for them to provide some of those healthy options, right? Restore OKC, they saw the emergency, they put together a grocery store. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing what the will of people can do if sometimes we just get out of our own way. This is just, I know you can't see that, I know, I, I apologize, it's very small. But the bottom line is that it shows the rich set of opportunities that speak to this issue of access to healthy foods. It doesn't have to be everybody doing the same thing. This is my lane, I'm staying in my lane, but can you send me some business every now and then? It has to be this kind of collective energy to make it all work. Um, how many of you have heard the name Ron Finley? Ron Finley, uh, YouTube Ron Finley. He used to be called the gorilla gardener. Now he calls himself the gangster gardener. And he reclaimed land in South LA just to grow fruits and vegetables. There was policy, there were ordinances in Los Angeles that said you can't grow food in your own front yard. You can't grow food on the kind of the causeway. So he just, he just planted some, as you can see, he, he had a plan. He was just gonna grow some stuff. And that's the plan. And now he's developing gardeners all over the city. Right? Um, women, women, women Works, which, which was basically a, an organization that was the intermediary between a set of farmers and the communities, underserved communities. And they literally connected underserved communities to thousands of tons of food simply by letting the farmers know there is a demand for your product, just give us an opportunity to show you that it's there. This is farmers markets again. All the things that people see are ready access to, to food. And I found out, you know, great thing about the community meeting. Uh, Kwame told me that, you know, from November to April, the farmers markets are closed. That's a lot of, that's quite a bit of time without access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Who comes in to provide something during those months when, that means my, my thing, my time is up, but my microphone wasn't working, so I'm gonna talk for like maybe one more minute. <laughs> All right. See, it almost worked. So um, again, I just, I just want to, to send a message of, um, there are multiple ways to get to where we're trying to go. I think we do ourselves a disservice when we say, my way is the only way to do it. I want to make it very, very clear that if we, Northeast Oklahoma City, and my, the majority of my family, my brothers, my sisters, still live in Northeast Oklahoma City, they're retired, so they've got some free time. If you guys got projects, they can probably help you out. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm just trying, I'm trying to keep distract from being emotional because I spent the first 30 years of my life in Oklahoma City. And it's hard to come home and in some instances th see things worse than better. But then to not go too far to the south are too far to the west and see what happens when the will is there and the commitment is there and the money is there and people quit with their excuses. 
I want us to understand that if we're not a, um, singing from the same playbook, we might get left behind, and it's time out for that. Thank you. Oh, it's this one. Let's give her another round of applause. I think it's important for us to keep, keep that in mind. As she said, she was here for 30 years and left and it still looks the same. I, I'm reminded of a, a convert, of worse, I'm sorry. Um, thank you for that correction because obviously it is worse. Um, but I'm reminded of a conversation that I had with an, another gentleman just a couple weeks ago. He was here for the Oklahoma City Public School Foundation Hall of Fame and he also lives in California. And he said he went to Douglas High School and he said the conditions are worse. So this is from the outside looking in of what this community has to deal with throughout these years. And now we're gonna hear from Dr. Bryce Lowry. He's an assistant professor of regional and city planning at the University of Oklahoma Gibbs College of Architecture. And if you hear a little of Dr. Lewis in there, that is because he was one of her students, uh, one of her former students at USC. So we are pleased that he is here to be with us and please welcome Dr. Bryce Lowry. I'm gonna give the microphone a try, put my timer on so I can be respectful of my colleagues. Thank you so much for having me here. I am sorta of local, kind of in Norman, right? Um, but uh, new to Oklahoma still, it feels like I've been here six years, but it all still feels very, very new. And so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about my work, um, uh, my history with Dr. Lewis. Uh, really great that I could bring her here, but um, she has been, uh, touchstone for me throughout my time as a nerd in this world, and uh, I, uh, I owe so much to her and my advisor, David Sloan, who both were there for me when I needed them, but really great to be here. Uh, I am an assistant professor at the College of Architecture down in Norman, and happy to be available to folks locally who might need any help from me. If I can be useful, please let me know. Um, my work largely focuses on sort of five areas. Uh, public health, I worked for 10 years in the Los Angeles County Public Health Department serving almost 10 million people, largely planning uh, mostly in South and Eastern Los Angeles for any number of things. And I can remember when I got really interested in urban planning and design, we would go to community meetings and we would be talking to people about fresh food or about access to a medical center and almost always the stuff that came up when we talked to folks was about transportation and you begin to see this mixing of public health and planning together. At that time I can remember it was a fairly new phenomenon for us to talk about these things together and today it gives me great hope and great uh, pride to hear that this is something we're all talking about at the same time now in one, in one voice and so it's really good to hear. More recently, I've been looking at food systems, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that work today, mostly here in Oklahoma. Uh, I did, when I get here, have to sort of uh, acclimate myself to Oklahoma. I had lived 20 years uh, in Los Angeles, where it's very, very dense. Uh, 10 million people, uh, grocery stores, fairly frequent, and so I wanted to get a sense of sort of what I was sort of seeing here in uh, the local Oklahoma area, and so I'll talk to you about that. I too focus on this idea of planning and public policy. I think that we aren't really doing ourselves justice if we just tell a community you should be fixing the problem. I think in many cases we need to be channeling and working with folks like Councilwoman Nice, uh, the mayor and other individuals to make sure that these policies go in place that will leave a legacy that helps people understand even when we're gone, this was our intent. This was where we wanna see this community get to and that's where I really think public policy comes into play. And then last but not least, and I phrase it a little bit differently than Lavana, but I really am focused on this idea of spatial inequality. We see across time, across history, if you are a low income, uh, particularly person of color, black, Latino, in the United States, you have less access to almost everything than well-off white people do. And I think that's something that we need to really start opening up a lot more. I think um, I'm happy to talk about it in more uh, direct terms, but um, in my own nerd way, spatial inequality helps me sort of focus my work on something that I think is really, really important. 
Uh, my focus is really on food insecurity, and I, we were asked, I think, to give a definition of what we mean by food insecurity when we talk about it, and my definition comes largely from the United Nations. They really focus on three primary components when we think about food security, so availability. Uh, is the food there? Is quality food, healthy food, available to folks nearby? Uh, second, access. Can people get to it? Is it something they can actually reach? Is it something they can afford? Uh, can people actually buy these things? Uh, and then last, uh, utilization. Do people actually make the food? Do they prepare the food? I've heard many stories in the last few days about one of the big challenges, and we see this across the board, is we have a, a, a cohort of young people now who don't cook. Right? I find myself not cooking a lot as well, and so how do we begin to instill again a culture of making food that may not be laden with preservatives or come from a box? And then last but not least, and I think the, the more important component here is really the public policy piece, this idea of creating a stable food system through public intervention. How do we dedicate resources, dedicate time, uh, employ individuals to get out there and do some of this important work? And so where I focus most of my work really is on availability and access. Uh, over the last two years, I've spent, uh, actually my first two years here, I spent the summers of both of those years, I uh, have the famous or infamous uh, title of man who's visited every grocery store in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and so I toured the entire state looking, uh, sort of as a, and I don't mean any uh, sort of disrespect for to Ashante, who is an actual anthropologist, but I did a little bit of anthropology just to see what is it that's going on in Oklahoma with grocery stores. Um, and so I would go into stores uh, all over the, the state, uh, find some things. I'd walk into a couple stores where the smell of rotten meat pushed me outside. Um, expired food abounded, particularly in very small rural communities. I saw that too in some of our urban locations, right? I'm sure many of you are familiar. And so thinking about what could we begin to do to think about sort of how this is going. My interest, much like Dr. Lewis, is sort of in this area, right? We are seeing across the board in the United States a decrease in the consumption of healthy food. Uh, rates of obesity, rates of diabetes, uh, cardiovascular risk on the rise in ways that we don't really understand. Uh, I'm working right now with a team at OU who is actually going into the gut micro microbiome, which is a new area of research to see what's actually going on in our stomachs regarding food. We're finding huge levels of transformation because of preservatives, right? These things that we put in our body that we don't on a day-to-day -day basis feel or understand, but when you look over time, people in more developed countries are seeing actual genetic changes in the way that we actually process food. And we're worried that that may have some very long-term implications for what we do. And so, some very sad statistics. Obviously, Oklahoma, we are almost always, you know, between 45th and 50th on all of these measures. And so I think, I, I tell Dr. Lewis, she told me when I moved here, she's like, it's gonna be okay. I didn't know Oklahoma, so I was a little terrified. And I, I really, and I told her yesterday or the day before, I think I had a calling to be here, right? To, to work on these kinds of issues in a place that we need this, right? And so, thank you, thank you. We also, and I think Dr. Lewis had the same graph, um, we see uh, over time spending on prepared food more than groceries, right? We are in a culture now where we don't go out and buy fresh fruits and vegetables, but we, in 2015, for the first time ever in our history, we found more people buying food prepared from a box, from a container, rather than food that they would go home and prepare themselves. We also see this rise in farmer's markets. So two very interesting phenomena, right? We want this fresh local food, but we also want convenience. And I think we talked about this the other day in some of our meetings, um, this idea that how do we begin to also work with large-scale grocery stores to create more healthy, convenient food? For any of you who have been to Edmond, to the Uptown Grocer, there's a lot of healthy prepared food up there. You come into a market in a low-income community, there's no healthy prepared food available, right? And so this, I think, is a point of discussion that we need to also focus on as we move forward. Working with this grocery store or any grocery store that comes in to say, hey, yeah, we want a deli, but can the deli also have some options that aren't always a potato salad covered in mayonnaise, right? That kind of discussion. So thinking a little bit farther down the road. We're also seeing a lot of change, and I think this is where I, I try to, we all three of us talked about grocery stores as sometimes being good, sometimes being bad. I want to remind us all too that grocery stores are under a tremendous amount of pressure right now. We see things like the demand for local and organic pushing organizations like Whole Foods to become the largest purchaser of organic food in the country. Right? So when I went into the panhandle and looked for organic food, Walmart was the only place that carried it. 
right? And so this idea that we, uh, we often ostracize Walmart for what it is, I think it has a role to play in how we think about moving forward. The growth of food delivery obviously has challenged grocery stores in many, many ways, right? Amazon, there is a discussion among some folks I know that we see the grocery store here, right? This is our layout of a typical grocery store. Folks are suggesting that that middle, the packaged food area, is gonna eventually go away from our grocery stores because it will be replaced wholly by someone like Amazon. Chips can come to you right at your house, soda can come to you right at your house, but what you need is this outside. And so it's being called the donut model of grocery store development. And so we could begin to imagine grocery stores also sort of trying to uh, cater to this sort of demand that we're seeing. In Oklahoma in particular, something I very rarely hear people talk about is our new introduction of wine and beer sales which I would imagine is gonna make grocery stores more robust economically, right? That is hand over foot money that's coming in the door from wine and beer. And so how do we begin to also understand what that means for the longevity and sustainability of grocery stores? And then we've been in the last two days talking a great deal about hydroponics. We have, I moved from California where you could drop a seed in the ground and grow anything, to Oklahoma where you can't put anything in the ground and grow it. <laughs> I'm a good gardener in California. Here, I've not been able to get a tomato to grow in my backyard. And so I, I, I just want to be mindful, too, of this push for people to garden. I find that when we get people to garden and it's not successful, it's almost more detrimental when, than when we show them how to do it correctly and work with them to make it work correctly. So I think there's a great opportunity here in hydroponics, right? We have, particularly in Oklahoma City, a lot of land, a lot of empty industrial land as well, where you could imagine large-scale hydroponic farming going on in ways that that I think would really transform our ability to get local food, which is really hard to find right now, and our ability to maybe become a provider for other parts of the Great Plains in terms of food. My grocery store survey here, uh, currently working on this still with some students, but these are the stores that we see, right, obviously at Oklahoma City and Tulsa, very robust locations for grocery stores, but when you look at the micro scale, you see something very, very different. We also have counties where there is no store, right, and so these kinds of places have been interesting to me. I'm trying to balance my time rural to urban and think about this diversity that we see. Across the state, we have about 558 stores, about 84, 83 of those, depending on the day, are here in Oklahoma City in different places if you want to seek them out. I was looking at a number of different types of stores, and what I will tell you that what I'm finding, and it's uh, kind of disheartening but also understandable, is that when we look across the board, low-income minority communities, communities of color, black communities, have fewer grocery stores. But what I'm also finding is that that's having very little impact on the actual health outcomes that we're seeing. And so we begin to think back to Dr. Lewis's comment about the presence of unhealthy food, choices people are making, and the ability of folks to cook healthy food for themselves that might offset the presence of a Brahms, of a Sonic, of another type of place where you can get food. And so, yes, we have less access, but that access doesn't seem to be translating into actual health outcomes. And so thinking a little bit further about how do we actually go into some of these places and say, it's not just the grocery store, there might be other things going on that might include preferences, right? We all like, uh, what do we talk, spicy Cheetos. They're really bad for you. Um, soda, soda to me, and most, most of my time when I talk to folks, I'm like, soda is, should be treated as a dessert. It's essentially a piece of pie that you're putting in your body as a drink. And so that kind of health education also needs to be a part of us thinking about Dr. Lewis's focus on built environment and physical environment. When we look at Oklahoma City in particular, so I'm going to zoom in. These are the stores that I inventoried here. You'll see the state capitol, the star, right? You're all very, oh, I have a pointer. Hold on. Right here. Ooh. Sorry, okay, pointer, yep. So State Capitol, uh, Lake Hefner Airport, we're all familiar, this is your community, right? The community that we're talking about. Uh, when I show my students this map, one of the first things they notice obviously is that there's only one grocery store left here. But also in planning, we immediately see the freeways, right? The cut, the, the, the way that we have cut this community up into a tiny little piece that's completely isolated from the rest of the city, I think is also a part of this discussion, right? We don't have easy ways in and out Trying to go under the freeway is probably one of the most horrifying things I've ever had to do. I walked that from the state capitol to the other side of 23rd once, and it was just like, oh my god, my life. <laughs> we also know, and we <laughs> thank you, thank you for laughing. Uh, we also know that there isn't a great robust transit system here in Oklahoma City, and so I think Embark or others need to be a part of this conversation as well to think about how do we, if, if you don't have a car or if you're underage and not able to drive yet, how do we also give you the opportunity to get to a place where you can get some healthy food? And so we begin to look at some of these things. 
Typically in our world, we buffer these spots with about a one mile buffer to say that's about the reach of the grocery store. And so these are each of those grocery stores with a one mile buffer. We see a number of things going on, right? First of all, obviously our, this community we're talking about, the Otwells here, uh, there is a large swath of this area that is uncovered by a grocery store, essentially. There's no coverage. We see other areas as well, right? Along the river, down along the, the roadway, out by the airport. This may or may not be important, but I think Oklahoma City in general needs to look comprehensively at these spots to think about, are these areas where, is it about a grocery store, or might, might we be thinking about better transit opportunities, linking to sidewalks, bike paths, what might be the ways to help some of these areas where we don't see grocery store coverage to help people to get in and out of there to get to a grocery store that might be helpful to them. Because I come from planning, I often look at land use, so prepare yourself, but this is our zoning map for Oklahoma City, right? The places that should pop out to you when you look at this map are the places that are not covered by a buffer that are yellow. Those are residential districts, right? And so we see a number of large swaths of residential development in many, many parts of the city uh, up here, right, where people have to get in a car to get groceries. This isn't necessarily a problem. I get it. We all, we live in a car culture. But wouldn't it be nice if we started thinking more holistically about allowing people alternative ways of getting to the grocery store? Right? We begin to build sidewalks, we think about transit, we think about these shuttle services that could also be employed in these areas to help link folks who might be isolated. My parents I know are in their 80s now, I'm beginning to worry about folks like that, and young people who don't have access to a car, and so how do we begin to connect some of these places and think fruitfully about how to connect to grocery stores. The other thing I want you to see that I don't see in many other cities in the United States is all the green is agriculturally zoned land. Oklahoma City has a robust amount of area dedicated to agriculture still that we need to be thinking about. Whether or not that's to drop a seed in the ground or to build a hydroponic farm, right, to raise some cattle that might be local, there are a lot of things there that I think we should be thinking about in terms of land use, in terms of policy to say, maybe one of these corners becomes a place for local food production, right, where we can actually grow food for our people. Moving forward, I know there's a lot of interest in dollar stores. I've recently found these things fascinating. So if you look, uh, the pink dots that have popped on the screen are the dollar stores in Oklahoma City. There's a lot of them, right? And what I'm gonna show you now is a buffer of those places with a one mile buffer. And what you're gonna notice is that we have far more coverage by dollar stores than we do by grocery stores in this city. It is so much easier for us to get to a dollar store where there is no healthy food than it is for us to get to a grocery store. And so I think we do need to be mindful. I know that in LA we were very, very successful with blocking out some of these kinds of businesses. I'm not saying that's necessarily what I advocate for, but I want us to be mindful of what we do as we move forward. I, like Lavana, have become very proud of this place. It's my home now. I uh, am hopefully gonna be able to stay here longer and keep my job. And I would love to be a part of seeing Oklahoma City become the world-class place that you all tell me you want it to be. Part of that means food, right? And so how we think about how, the, how we move that, that barometer forward, what we need to do, I think there's going to be a lot of options. And I, I hope to be a part of the discussion. I also hope you all will be part of that discussion because you're clearly here, you're clearly interested. And there are things we can do. And local power is extremely amazing. I'm just going to say that right now. We can do a lot of things. Sometimes we don't even know what we can do. And so please, uh, stay with us. Uh, be thankful that you sent this woman to me who then taught me what I've learned. Uh, I, uh, I tear up thinking about it all, so thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Oh, one last thing, one last thing. I want to remind everyone that in 2018, we won a giant award for our comprehensive plan. Our comprehensive plan also contains all of these items here. Community gardens, reduced access to low nutrition food, preservation of agricultural land, formation of a local food policy council, incentives to assist stores to stock healthy food, and at the very bottom, prioritization of underserved areas. So the next time some politician tells you this isn't what we're doing in Oklahoma City, they actually said this is what they're doing in Oklahoma City. <laughs> and it's in a document that won a giant award, and when I asked planners here on staff at Oklahoma City what's going on with this, silence. Good luck. Well, obviously, as you hear, geography and environmental sciences at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And she has written a book uh, that talks about uh, her 
data that she has done in her community um, as far as addressing food security. And she has very, very great information that I know you will in need to hear. So please, let's welcome Dr. Reese. Man, last, yeah. Um, I'm also going to set my timer because I could talk all day. So thank you for um, inviting me. This invitation came partly because Bryce follows me on Twitter. And Twitter is a great place to me um, for people to connect. And so thank you for following me on Twitter. Um, and thank you to everybody who had a hand in inviting me. So I'm, I'm going to offer four provocations for us to consider today. Um, before I do, I just want to share a little bit about my background. Before I was an anthropologist and a professor, I was a middle school teacher. I taught middle school to students in Atlanta, Georgia, sixth and seventh grade, who lived in the 30314 zip code. And what brought me into, I knew I wasn't going to teach middle school because bureaucracy, right? I knew I was going to go to grad school. But what made me, what I thought I was going to do was study education. What changed my mind was I had taken some students to a grocery store with me in my neighborhood at the time that was less than five miles from where they lived. And these usually rambunctious 11, 12 year old girls are in this grocery store with me and they are quiet as little mice and I have no idea why. So I pick up things to take them home with me um, to cook them dinner before taking them back to their home in the 30314 zip code where I knew they may or may not have gotten dinner that night. And one of the students asked me as I was preparing this fabulous vegetable lasagna with these organic vegetables because I wanted to feed these children something great. Why is your grocery store so nice? I was like, um, it's not just a grocery store. Chop my vegetables. She's like, it's not just a grocery store. And that night over that fabulous lasagna that I made, um, we talked about the differences in our grocery stores. So when I decided to apply for grad school, I felt a mixture of curiosity and shame that I couldn't answer the questions that they asked me. So I decided that that's what I was gonna dedicate my career to doing. So shout out to the middle school students at Coretta Scott King Young Women's Leadership Academy. One other thing I'm gonna say about those students. That year that I taught seventh grade, we were learning about civil um, disobedience and so I thought, as like a teacher, it would be really great for us to think about, what would this look like if we were going to simulate this in real life? So I was like, what are some things in the school that you want to change? And one of the things that they really wanted different was food in the cafeteria. So we go through this whole exercise. We talk about what civil disobedience was. I have a background in organizing. We talked about strategy. And I was like, yeah, that was a great unit. And then the students were like, so when are we going to do the stuff that we said? And I was like, oh, OK. Um, and so they designed a boycott of the school cafeteria. And the one criteria that I gave them was that you can boycott the cafeteria as long as you want. These people can fire me based on your boycott, but you cannot let anybody go without lunch any day, and I will pull this if you do. And so these 11 and 12 year olds who lived in the 30, uh, I keep saying the zip code because I want you to, it's very similar to the kinds of things you have here in Oklahoma City. 30314 zip code, most of them living in homes, um, uh, impoverished homes, most of them living in public housing projects that at the time were being torn down because the city of Atlanta had this fantastic plan to tear down all the public housing, um, which we know from other cities doesn't actually work, but I digress. And these students um, who didn't have much themselves would often bring an extra lunch so that their classmates would not go hungry while we were boycotting the cafeteria. I didn't get fired. Maybe I would have gotten fired, um, but I had already decided to not come back. So <laughs> I offer them because often when we're thinking about solutions, I think about those students that I taught and I think about young people who I encounter who teach me more about solutions than any planner than anybody with a PhD, than anyone who's in a position of power. All right, so I'm going to talk about my provocations. I'm going to give you kind of three caveats. One, um, my understanding of food comes from the realization that food is never just about food. 
And so any conversations that we're having where we're only talking about fruits and vegetables, we've already kind of gone down the wrong path. Food becomes a powerful lens for us to evaluate community. It becomes a powerful lens for us to evaluate the things that we value. And in, in my case, what my real interest is, food is a lens that helps us talk about inequities in ways that other things don't. Um, for some reason, you can sit down and talk over a plate of food with people um, about almost anything and get at something that is deeper than the surface. So food is never just about food. The second thing is, when I started my research in Washington, D.C., many people thought I was a nutritionist. Um, they wanted to know if I was measuring what was on their plate. And I became very accustomed to telling people, I don't actually care what's on your plate, but I'm going to fight every day for you to have a right to put whatever it is you want on your plate. And so that is also a perspective that I'm coming from and which is why you will not see any slides about health outcomes um, from me. That's not my lane. Um, the other thing I am gonna offer is that as long as we're treating health as an individual imperative, we're also already going down the wrong lane, right? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about supermarkets because apparently people think I'm a little bit of an expert on supermarkets. But I also think there's a larger conversation about health policies, about food labeling, about why we live in a country that things that are unhealthy can be called food in the first place. And if we're not going to hold corporations accountable, then I don't think we can displace corporate responsibility to individual responsibility. And then the last thing I'm going to say, which is probably going to be the thing that, um, if there is a thing that doesn't get me invited, is that capitalism isn't going to save us. Um, so the first thing, first provocation is, um, is this, that policies aimed at addressing food access and food insecurity that do not grapple with racism, particularly anti-black racism, will not create sustainable solutions. And what I mean by this, I'm going to try to use this little clicker thing. This is what we see in food research, particularly food justice and food systems research. There has been a real focus on global agribusiness and transnational corporations, including in that supermarkets. And then there's this path of alternative food movements where people are interested in CSA, community supported agricultures, community garden, urban agriculture, all of that. And then there's been a group of people over the last 20 years or so, maybe 25 years, who were thinking about race and racism as a slice of this pie, right? One of the things that I've noticed is when we talk about race and racism as a part of the pie, we end up talking about individual kinds of actions that happen, um, individual bodies of people that are impacted. One of the things that I do in my research is think about how is the entirety of the food system surrounded and influenced by anti-blackness, Anti-blackness is not that you necessarily hate black people. When we say anti-blackness, it is how are the ways racism are encoded in policy? How are they encoded in the neighborhoods? Um, we've already heard a little bit about neighborhoods. How are they encoded in things like redlining, all of that, right? These policies that very specifically were trying to keep black people out of certain spaces. How, what changes when we have this kind of conception? And to me, this isn't just about black people. You heard a little bit earlier that wealthier white neighborhoods have more access than black neighborhoods, but that's actual, actually slightly also untrue. White neighborhoods, regardless of class, have greater access to resources than black neighborhoods, even wealthy black neighborhoods. Right, and this is um, so. There's lots of sociologists who've done this work. So this is what we mean by like the anti-blackness that surrounds our food system and where things are located. This has an impact on lower income white families too. I can talk a little bit about this during Q&A if you would like. Low income white families tend to be clustered in communities with black or other people of color, which is how they become impacted by this, right? So in that way, the ways that whiteness can protect when neighborhoods are predominantly white, um, low income or poor white folks don't have those same kinds of protections. I want to show you a couple of things because sometimes people are like, supermarkets, they're not racist, they're just looking for their bottom line. Okay. Um, this is a magazine cover from 1967, 1966, 1967, 1968. 
were really important years in U.S. history because of the amount of um, what some people call riots, what others call uprisings that were happening around the country in response to the kinds of injustices that were happening. I offered a quote from the inside. There's a cover. This is the cover. And what you see is this kind of the inner cities, the riots, this kind of building on fire. You can see the police here. And then this quote that's talking about in 1967, this is 1967, 1967. Um, that the opportunities to shop at a supermarket are a part of the American dream, right? But that that is unequally distributed um, depending on where someone lives. The other reason I like this cover is because this is one of the first, at least to my knowledge, going through supermarket, this is a supermarket trade magazine, the first time where the connection between quote unquote inner cities and violence was made in a trade magazine. If you look at supermarkets today and they cite their reasons for why they do or do not open in neighborhoods, violence is always somewhere between number three and number five reasons for why they do not open in a neighborhood. I'm gonna offer, this is a hand-drawn map from 1948 in Washington, D.C., um, the Deanwood neighborhood where I've spent most of my time and my work. Very nicely hand-drawn map. The map doesn't actually matter much. What matters is this quote from 1948. John Weimer, after drawing this map, says that houses are great, you know, this is a pretty stable um, mixed income neighborhood, but it still lacks some of the um, things that you might see in other parts of the city, and specifically this lack of adequate shopping facilities. Again, 1948. So if we're thinking about the legacies of racism and anti-blackness in the food system, they stem much further than the closing of this particular supermarket, right? And these histories are important for us to understand how do we get at the root of things. So this is Deanwood, um, the neighborhood in D.C. It is also in Ward 7, so I have a Ward 7 um, in D.C. Has These are some of the demographics. This is where it's located. I'm speeding through because what I actually want you to see is this. Supermarkets plan out often where they're going to locate their newest stores. And so what you see in this graph, DC has um, eight wards. Ward seven and ward eight are east of the Anacostia River, which has long been a dividing line in DC. About 95% of the total population east of the Anacostia River is black. And what you also see is these greater disparities around class. You see ward three, you see ward four, but also, at the time um, that I started doing this research, you could see that there were declines in the number of supermarkets east of the Anacostia River, which also has, I took it off of the slide, but they also have the highest burden of um, diabetes and other diet-related diseases. You see that there are no planned supermarkets, and actually, as of today, those numbers, these numbers aren't even accurate anymore. There are two um, supermarkets east of the Anacostia River to serve 150,000 residents. This is what it looks like on a map. Inevitably, someone asks, and so I'm gonna help you help me um, to not ask this question during the Q&A. Someone inevitably asks or says, but this is a class issue. This is not a race issue. Why do you keep bringing up race? What you see on this map, um, on this side, the, this is um, the darker the color, the greater percent African American. So this is the Anacostia River that I was telling you about, and these are all the black people who live east of the Anacostia River. These little shopping carts that you cannot see are actually stores. Now, if we look at class, right, um, the same parts of the city that have highest percentages of African Americans also has darker co colors, are median incomes less than $37,000 a year. So there is no separating race and class, right? So don't ask me about class. Same things, same things are happening um, to the same folks that don't have um, access to money are the same folks who are predominantly black, at least in Washington, D.C. So there's that, anti-blackness is there. Second provocation is we can't just open new stores. Residents actually have ideas about what they want. Meeting their basic needs is not the only thing that residents want. So I take us to uh, a Safeway in Ward 7 in Washington, D.C. Um, one, of, one of my research participants calls it the unsafe way. Um, and I added this slide after hearing some things yesterday because the same kinds of questions about quality, 
your people in DC are asking the same questions, are making the same comments. In 2016, I was approached by some residents um, who wanted to start a food co-op and asked if I would participate in the, in the efforts. And I said, sure, I'll participate. One thing that I can offer as a researcher, I will design the survey, I will um, disseminate the survey through my institutional affiliation, and then I will turn the data back over to you to use as you, as you please. One of the things that I had on the survey was an open-ended question that just said, tell me what you want me to know. Out of the 108 respondents, almost every single person used that open-ended question to complain about this safe way. The only one that is um, nearest, it's not even in their neighborhood, nearest to their neighborhood. And these are some of the kinds of comments. And there's actually a comment, it's my favorite, I didn't put it on here in case someone was gonna like video this, that was basically like, this safe way needs to be burned down. Um, <laughs> So I, I didn't put that on there. This picture is of Vince Gray, who is the council person. Let me just say this. To have an engaged council person who is leading this charge, because let me tell you, I've been doing research since 2009. I ain't never met this man. And I have reached out to him, and I've tried to like say, I have all this stuff that can help Ward 7. And you, know, you can tweet this if you want. He's in his fancy, really nice house in Ward 7. And he don't have to worry about this um, sorry, I'm trying not to cut. He doesn't have to worry about this safe way because he has so many more options, right? So if anybody knows Vince Gray in DC, tell him to holler at your girl because I got stuff that could help him, right? Um, so this is him in 2018 meeting with um, one of the managers at the Safeway because there was an investigative report that happened that showed that there were moldy meats and expired pro meats and produce in the store. And so Vince Gray, um, he made an appearance. And so what, was in, what is important about him making an appearance though is that, which is why I point to your council person, is that him making an appearance, it meant something. And it has meant a much more robust conversation about what could happen in Ward, um, Ward 7. So residents have needs, y'all. It's not just that they want a store, they want quality store, they want quality goods in their stores. The third provocation, um, we're not just kind of waiting for corporations to um, make a change. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. But that people are actually what I call quiet food refusals. And what I mean by refusal is refusing to um, not have their needs met, refusing to accept low quality, refusing to live uh, in a world or refusing to accept a world that says because you live in the zip code and because you live east of the Anacostia River, you don't deserve the nice stuff that's west of the Anacostia River, right? And so these are kind of three large areas that people have critiques, but they also engage histories of self-reliance and um, community gardening. And then if you read my book, I write about them as black food geographies, that people have real emotional connections to accessing food. So when we sit here and talk about supermarkets and don't talk about how people feel about it, that's a real problem. People feel things. You should write that down. People feel things. Um, you know, I know grocery shopping becomes this impersonal thing that we talk about, but people do care about who's working in their stores. Um, they care about having these conversations that they have in their stores. And in some cases, people get really emotional about how impacted and how much they internalize the feeling that I don't have nice things in my neighborhood, so I did something wrong. So those are kind of the affective dimensions. People are navigating these unequal landscapes. Would ha be, love to talk about this a little bit more around um, engaging their neighbors, ride shares, all of these different things. And then they're also altering or transgressing the neighborhood space. And what I mean by that is we already know that regardless of if there's a store in a neighborhood, people are going to find what they need, period. That's part of the impetus why it is, there's not a lot of motivation sometimes for corporations to locate neighborhoods because people in most impacted neighborhoods will just drive somewhere else. Um, one of the things I would love to talk about is uh, what would happen if we closed all the stores in the wealthy neighborhoods and located them in the poor neighborhoods and then all the wealthy people had to drive over to the poor side of town. Um, I don't know what would happen, right? But I think it could be a really interesting um, experience. And then the last provocation, because my timer is going to go off in just a second, is that if we're looking for what is possible, the heart of that already exists in the communities that are most impacted. And I put this little note here that um, 
what people imagine and plan and create also has to exist beyond supermarkets. I'm gonna tell this little story and then um, I'm gonna be done. I got one more minute. I don't know if you can tell, but this is public housing in the background. These are people who are dancing. They're actually doing the wobble um, in the foreground. This community was, is actively being shut down in Washington, D.C. And these people who are doing the wobble are gardeners who started a community garden at this, at this housing project. So I, um, oh, let me tell you about this other picture. In this housing project, a typical unit has a window in the living room and a window in the bedroom. Um, one of the gardeners, in an effort to make um, kind of a makeshift greenhouse, would take some of the plants in the, you know, when the beds are gone to rest, and bring them inside and incubate him and uh, incubate them um, using the two windows in his apartment. So this is one of the photos, uh, one of the windows in his apartment. So I go to this garden, or I used to go to this garden a lot, and uh, one of the gardeners I asked one day, I said. I'm curious about why you all keep gardening when this, you know, the housing project's been torn down, your neighbors are already being relocated. And the, the gardener looked at me and she said, you read about that, I, I see you've been on the internet. And I said, yes, Ms. Johnson, I've, I read about it, but I also kind of know about the city's plans to redevelop this entire neighborhood. And so one of the things that she said was, well, we're not trying to see this building come down. We're not trying to see any of it come down. We're, we will not perish. We're going to keep flourishing. And when I think, I think about her words pretty much uh, every day because that's the vision of what we're looking for. It's not about the supermarket. It's not about who gets to have control over whatever. Um, these are real people who... I guarantee you, if you ask them about the other kinds of issues that are going on, it's not just food. There's probably financial security issues. There are probably education issues. There's probably joblessness. There are all of these things. And what people are trying to do is literally not die. Um, and so I just want to end with this quote from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who is a radical geographer, um, aboli prison abolitionist, and such. And I love this quote because it's talking about the ways that things already exist, even if they're fragmented, the kind of worlds we want to create, there's already stuff that is happening. And what's been the, the joy for me here is looking and seeing the kinds of things that are already happening in OKC. And so I just want to offer one little thing, which is for anyone who is thinking about starting something new, I encourage you to look at what's old and what's already there. Thank you. Is it our time to be up here? She kept it real. Let's give her another round of applause, Dr. Reese. <laughs> Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take a, a short pause because some of us need to ponder on what we just heard and think about uh, what we can do better in our own areas and strengthen our own neighborhoods and communities and our block together. So we're going to take, uh, we'll be back at 3 o'clock because it's 2.50 right now. We'll be back at 3 o'clock and we'll, we'll start the Q&A session. I think as we look at what has happened, especially in Northeast Oklahoma City, when you look at, in my opinion, the gateways to Northeast Oklahoma City, the Northeast 23rd MLK, 36 and Kelly, those gateways, who controls the land? That's the conversation um, that we have to continue to educate our community. And when people ask me the question, why can't we get this? Why can't we get that? Well, my 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 answer is, who owns the land? If we see who owns the land, and specifically, I won't say which one, one of those owners has owned a piece of property for over 50 years. And it literally has not appreciated in value because they have not invested resources in it. So again, Let's all think about those things. As I help to work with policy, we have to understand who controls the land as well. 
Much of the conversation, this is a conversation for the group as well, so we'll start with you, Dr. Lewis. Much of the conversation surrounding food insecurity orients supermarkets and grocery stores as a cure, and we just heard from Dr. Reese, it is not the cure. Uh, is this realistic in your opinion? And I know you've touched on it as well, but why or why not? So, again, I think it's important to understand that um, it should be all hands on deck. I mean, I, I think the interesting part is that we're having a conversation around what should or shouldn't be there, recognizing that in other places these things are already there. And so, it, I mean, it's, it's a different conversation. I mean, we, we can critique the role of the grocery store, but um, it's, very, it's very hard not to be sympathetic to people who are locked into what's available right now. I mean, if you've got discretionary income, if you've got freedom, if you've got transportation, then this may not be an issue for you. But if you live at the senior center and you have to walk to, the, walk to get whatever you want to get, then the fact that you can't get to the place that even though it may have been substandard, food is not discretionary. You have to eat. And so I think the, the real issue is are we, are we mindful of the fact that the real issue is I should at least have the choice. And right now we're saying that African Americans in Northeast Los Angeles, oops, sorry. I'm bringing both parts of my life together in one sentence. Uh, <laughs> in Oklahoma, Northeast Oklahoma City, don't get to exercise that choice. And most people in the room who exercise choice on a daily basis will be appalled by that. And then we're, we're, we're stunned by the fact that people are so upset about the fact that a resource, even though it may have been a substandard resource, is no longer uh, available. But I think the real issue is to understand that food is about access, it's about preference, it's about affordability. And so the question is, how many points of access do people have to what they need? I mean, it's like there, there are some things that, I mean, I think, um, I mean, we've done some work around ethnic markets. There are some things that wouldn't sell in other places. But if I need it in my community, why is it so hard for me to get it? And that kind of thing, the, the responsiveness. Yes, we know that these things are operating on limited kind of market shares. But again, it's, it's just an acknowledgment of the fact that um, it's about equity, right? I mean, I shouldn't have to work so hard to make a decision about where I'm going to go. For, for, other, for some folks, it's my, I have to get gas, I have to get a ride, I have to, all these other things that are part of the calculation. So for me, all those extra steps that I have to take were on my life, right? That's where the stress comes in. That's where, I mean, it's like just the coming and going, the, the surveillance, the, all the other things that make living as a black person, I'm black if you guys didn't know, um, just tougher, and so it's that, it's that recognition that, again, it's like, it's not, I'm not asking for anything that I shouldn't already have. Delivery, and that, I, I missed that part of the conversation on yesterday. It made me think about, um, and I know we've been talking about the one store that we did have in the community, and that one zip code that did shut their doors, but, uh, one of the comments that was made was, we deliver. And it's like, well, who can afford to even pay the tax for the delivery fee for you to bring it to them if they're already strapped to get certain amount of groceries already? How can they do that? And as you said, I know we'd like to thump our watermelons to make sure it's good. You like to thump the melons and all of that stuff. That's right. So how can you create that, that type of access? And if you want to um, ask a question, there are no, no cards available, please write your questions down. And this was a question from the audience, so we'll mix in those with the ones that were already prepared. In your time in OKC, what are the things that you've seen that give you hope? And where can we narrow focus in these specific places? Whoever wants to take that first. So, so I'll, I'll start, and I think, um, so in addition to being an academic, I'm also a pastor's wife. And so one of the things that really, um, well, two things that really encouraged me one was Restore OKC. Um, for a couple of 
the reasons. It's a faith-based organization that um, to be part of the to our health system of physicians and, and educating our communities about what that looks like as well. So again, you heard what our, our, our panelists had to say in their presentation. So now we're going to ask them some questions. And first up, we have for Dr. Lewis, when engaging in discussion surrounding food security, who needs to be at the table? So um, I think that one of the things that is, is important to consider is I, I would say the first person that needs to be at the table is a trusted agent because if a trusted agent isn't there, they're not going to be able to convene a meeting. And so there needs to be someone that the community has confidence in that, it, that maybe issues the first invitation. I think when we were doing our work, there wasn't a sector um, that we didn't try to have at the table. Uh, we had local community organizations, we had um, industry, I mean, we had the grocery stores at the table. I will say um, that the one group that was not um, invited to the table, well, wasn't accepted at the table, was actually law enforcement. And that was because they were criminalizing people in the community just for being in the community. And so the community felt that we can't have them in the room because we can't be honest. And so I think every I think we had the faith-based organizations that were there. We had big nonprofits. We had small nonprofits. But I think what made us work as a collaborative was the fact that if you had a $50,000 budget or a $5 million budget, you still just got one vote. So the whole power issue, uh, that's the way that we addressed it. If it was a no from the 50000 then it was a no for the whole collaborative. And I think it's important that people understand that, that equity at the table is going to be port important and people are going to be honest about what they want. Absolutely. Now, this question is for the group, or uh, we'll start with Dr. Reese. When power structures are in place that limit equitable representation, how should the community work with city leaders to balance power to include local community leaders? It's a loaded question. So the only thing that, that I would add to what's been said already is in a, there has to be a respect 
for community expertise and to, to recognize that the lived experiences are important. And, you know, when I first got to Los Angeles and was doing work in South LA, the community talked about drive-by research because that's what it was. People came in, they collected information, they did their study, and they were gone. And so this, this idea, and everybody in the, in the spaces got paid but the community. And so it, it gave me a sense of the importance of recognizing the need to elevate community expertise. And I think in, in order for the electors to be successful, I think people, when people know that you respect their story and respect them, they're more willing to support what you're trying to do. So we'll start with Dr. Lowry. Will you discuss legacies of historic redlining as it relates to land use and how that has affected food insecurity? I know we mentioned it a little bit, touched on it, but and also how can land use be used to support better health outcomes? Mm -hmm. um, of course, I, I, I hope most folks in here understand redlining is a process used uh, to discriminate against people races, often homes are always in America black, um, to keep them out of getting home loans to purchase homes in neighborhoods. And uh, this, I think we even talked about just the other day, persists today in different forms. I think it's more subliminal. It's not as written into doctrine of banks as it used to be. It's still, um, I know, speaking with an old student, Gina Sotopola, who's here. They worked on Paige Woodson, right, got this really interesting development up and going, and it was really hard to get comp for that neighborhood for the real estate that they developed. This continues today. I know uh, in that neighborhood in general, it's very difficult to get assessments of your property because there's just not comps that exist out there to build new property. That continues, and so we need to find ways around that. Um, I don't know what those might be. I'm not a fine, uh, financial planner by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but I also know that one of the things I stress to my students is that we have for too long, for too long, said planning is about commercial, residential, and industrial development. It's not about those things anymore. Right? We now have called overlay zones. We have historic preservation districts. We have, uh, in Los Angeles, sign districts for billboards to be in. Land use is expanding. And I think that it's one of the most exciting parts of planning right now is that we're given this opportunity really at a local level to determine what can be going on in some of these places. And we're finding that, in general, the federal government stays State government often stays out as well, and so we, it's our place of autonomy in many cases. And so, if local neighborhoods or local groups believe that, if, uh, for instance, the zip code that we're talking about, right, if that zip code came together and pressured maybe you or others to say, we really would like this to happen here, I think there's public policies that we can be innovative with to make that happen. Right? If it's an overlay to say no more dollar stores, if it's an overlay to say no more automobile uses. I realize that, and I moved from a state where you can regulate a lot to a place where we are extremely more libertarian. There are challenges here, right? Public policy has a limit, but I think that there are a lot, of, a lot of things we could be doing. Really, I think take land use, take land to another level to do really creative and things. So the only, the, the thing that I would say about the, the land use side is coming from the community lands. 
I would say with the African American Building a Legacy of Health Project and the Community Health Council in particular, I think that that collaborative was transformed when they made planning a bigger part of their agenda. And by that I mean, you know, when you have to basically have community convenings to uh, whether, you, whether it's a charrette or some other type of planning activity and they say that you must have community um, um, engagement, Community Health Council carved out that niche for themselves such that any development that the city planning and the county planning was considering in South LA in the kind of the three uh, general plan areas that they were working with, they knew for them to be credible in terms of their documentation, Community Health Council had to be at the table. And that often meant sending out the invitations who was gonna be at the table. And so that, that power shift, I think, is important. I, I also appreciate the fact that, that Bryce mentioned the fact that redlining is not the past, it's the present. And so we're dealing with the legacy of solutions that are, are decisions that were made before many of us ever got here. And I want us to acknowledge the fact that the policy has created the problem and policy also has to be the solution. And so when you lock communities out of advantage, access to capital, you can't then denigrate them and blame them for being locked out and not having access to capital. There is a sense of th their um, cause and effect. And so um, again, wanna be mindful of the fact that even though we, we would like to think of this as a kind of a historical conversation with Redline, it is sadly alive and well. And uh, also, obviously, as we're looking at redlining and what it looks in Northeast Oklahoma City, I think that speaks to why the community has not moved in the way it's moved or needs to move uh, because of that access barrier of, of our, our folks who live in the community not being able to be a part of the entrepreneurship of their own community. And also when you talked about um, who controls the land, I, I think as we look at what has happened, especially in Northeast Oklahoma City, when you look at, in my opinion, the gateways to Northeast Oklahoma City, the Northeast 23rd MLK, 36 and Kelly, those gateways, who controls the land? That's the conversation um, that we have to continue to educate our community. And when people ask me the question, why can't we get this? Why can't we get that? Well, my, my, my answer is, who owns the land? If we see who owns the land, and specifically, I won't say which one, one of those owners has owned a piece of property for over 50 years. And it literally has not appreciated in value because they have not invested resources in it. So again, let's all think about those things. As I help to work with policy, we have to understand who controls the land as well. Much of the conversation, this is a conversation for the group as well, so we'll start with you, Dr. Lewis. Much of the conversation surrounding food insecurity orients supermarkets and grocery stores as a cure, and we just heard from Dr. Reese, it is not the cure. Uh, is this realistic in your opinion? And I know you've touched on it as well, but why or why not? So, Again, I think it's important to understand that um, it should be all hands on deck. I mean, I, I think the interesting part is that we're having a conversation around what should or shouldn't be there, recognizing that in other places these things are already there. And so, it, I mean, it's, it's a different conversation. I mean, we, we can critique the role of the grocery store, but um, it's very... It's very hard not to be sympathetic to people who are locked into what's available right now. I mean, if you've got discretionary income, if you've got freedom, if you've got transportation, then this may not be an issue for you. But if you live at the senior center and you have to walk to, the, walk to get whatever you want to get, then the fact that you can't get to the place that even though it may have been substandard, food is not discretionary. You have to eat. And so I think the, the real issue is, are we, are we mindful of the fact that the real issue is, I should at least have the choice. And right now we're saying that African Americans in Northeast Los Angeles, 
oops, sorry. I'm bringing both parts of my life together in one sentence. Uh, <laughs> in Oklahoma, Northeast Oklahoma City, don't get to exercise that choice. And most people in the room who exercise choice on a daily basis will be appalled by that. And then we're, we're, we're stunned by the fact that people are so upset about the fact that a resource, even though it may have been a substandard resource, is no longer uh, available. But I think the real issue is to understand that food is about access, it's about preference, it's about affordability. And so the question is, how many points of access do people have to what they need? I mean, it's like there are some things that, I mean, I think, um, I mean, we've done some work around ethnic markets. There are some things that wouldn't sell in other places. But if I need it in my community, why is it so hard for me to get it? And that kind of thing, the, the responsiveness. Yes, we know that these things are operating on limited kind of market shares. But again, it's, it's just an acknowledgment of the fact that um, it's about equity, right? I mean, I shouldn't have to work so hard to make a decision about where I'm going to go. For, for, other, for some folks, it's my, I have to get gas, I have to get a ride, I have to, all these other things that are part of the calculation. So for me, all those extra steps that I have to take were on my life, right? That's where the stress comes in. That's where, I mean, it's like just the coming and going, the, the surveillance, the, all the other things that make living as a black person, I'm black if you guys didn't know, um, just tougher, and so it's that, it's that recognition that, again, it's like, it's not, I'm not asking for anything that I shouldn't already have. There's huge benefits to people who have personal autonomy and personal efficacy and are able to make choices on their own. And so for, I know yesterday we had a fairly insensitive question from someone who asked, well, what about food delivery? That's part of the solution, potentially, but there's also something to be said for people being able to go and pick the apple out of the 30 apples that they want to eat. I'm extremely picky about fruits and vegetables. <laughs> and so I can only imagine the rest of you are as well. And so to say we're going to deliver food to you, I just imagine you think, oh my God, it's the way a box of stuff that bruises. And we all have the right to. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. But I think personal autonomy is something we don't talk enough about, and there's huge value to a lot of people that make choices. Absolutely. And as you, you talk through that and the food delivery and that, I, I missed that part of the conversation on yesterday. It made me think about, um, and I know we've been talking about the one store that we did have in the community and that one zip code that did shut their doors. But uh, one of the comments that was made was, we deliver. And it's like, well, who can afford to even pay the tax for the delivery fee for you to bring it to them if they're already strapped to get certain amount of groceries already? How can they do that? And as you said, I know we'd like to thump our watermelons to make sure it's good. You like to thump the melons and all of that stuff. That's right. So how can you create that, that type of access? And if you want to um, ask a question, there are no, no cards available, please write your questions down. And this was a question from the audience, so we'll mix in those with the ones that were already prepared. In your time in OKC, what are the things that you've seen that give you hope? And where can we narrow focus in these specific places? Whoever wants to take that first. So, so I'll, I'll start, and I think, um, so in addition to being an academic, I'm also a pastor's wife. And so one of the things that really, um, well, two things that really encouraged me one was Restore OKC. Um, for a couple of reasons, it's a faith-based organization that um, to be part of the solution. Consider this when you're in this community that has been subjected to that location that store and changing hands um, and having a conversation of what it was supposed to be and what it ended up being was closed. Then you fast forward to two weeks later when you're in a conversation with pastors in a room and they're literally crying and saying, we want to know that we're welcome in your community. 
they are basically saying we can provide a service in 30 to 60 days, the preliminary conversation, to come back into the community and bring the same thing that they just closed back to the community. And here it is over 90 days later and that store still has not opened. So we just have to be real about what's happening in this community of promises that have not been upheld. And that's why I understand the frustration, I understand the fatigue, because it, it's real in this community. It's real about what we have to see, what we have to live with, and how we have to plan strategically, as you said, Dr. Lowry, how we're gonna get to where we need to go in order to provide for our families or ourselves, and then come back home and figure out how we're gonna make it the next day. It's a frustration on, on all sides. And I think we all understand, understand it and, and get that process. Well, let's give it up one more time for our panelists for being here with us. Great conversation. Please don't leave, don't leave yet. We still have, we want to get a closing from Cameron. He's going to come and close us out. But I want to say thank you all. Thank you to ULI for initiating this conversation. They, they said, we want, to, we want to talk about food security. Are you okay with that? I said, absolutely. And I thank the panelists and uh, their expertise because they did not hold back. Although, you know, we're working towards one effort. They say work towards others, and that's something that we have to all constructively look at and talk about what's going on. And to the community of those who are in your spaces, talking to your neighbors, if I don't know, I can't help you. It's just point blank and simple. If you aren't helping me to help you, it's hard for me to fight with the policy to get it done. So just be mindful of that as I, I'm working uh, to get policy in place to ensure that our communities are taken care of. With that, we welcome Mr. Cameron. I'll be brief. We've been here for a while, but um, I think every minute of this uh, symposium has been worth it. Um, thank you for being here through uh, from beginning to end. Um, for those who uh, may have come in a little late, I, my name is Cameron Ruhr. I'm the, the uh, ch current chair of ULI Oklahoma. However, we have a great team uh, that is surrounding uh, me, surrounding uh, all of us uh, in, in bringing great pr programming to our community. Um, this is one of many things that we do. Um, this is something that has been near and dear to our hearts uh, for ever since we started discussing the topic. And a uh, big thanks to Mark Zitzow, uh, programs chair. He's in the back there. And he, he, he was, when Councilwoman Nice uh, said that we came her way with the idea, it was uh, really him uh, coming uh, to the rest of our management team uh, with the idea to put this symposium on. So, um, and thank you to Michelle Macbeth, our staff member. Um, and I also want to uh, make sure we acknowledge, uh, again, our great sponsors for this event, the Lynn Institute, our presenting sponsor, the Northeast Oklahoma City Task Force. Um, I want to, in addition to other community partners that were uh, monetary sponsors as well as in-kind sponsors to help put this on, um, I want to uh, not to not not acknowledge the uh, the difficulties facing this issue, but um, just to reiterate uh, something Dr. Reese said, just as a, a piece of hope. Um, what I've uh, really loved uh, over the last uh, two three days and really last two or three months is. Um, a, my own personal discovery of how many organizations, uh, and it's organizations, not just individuals, there are many individuals as well. Um, we have convened uh, anywhere from 30 to 40 organizations that are involved in this effort, and so it's really a matter of uh, those organizations um, that have already been working together to continue to work together to, to uh, battle this issue together. And so, I um, also want to acknowledge uh, some efforts from the uh, city side, uh, the planning department, the sustainability department, they are um, working on a sustainability plan they have been for the last two years that is working towards adoption that will hopefully adopt um, some of those items that were called for in Plan OKC. And so 
Um, I uh, just can't thank you enough for being here. Um, if nobody showed up today, uh, then nobody would hear this message, and, and I'm glad you did. So um, thanks again, and uh, we look forward to continued discussion. And thank you to our, our guests. Yes, thank you. Sure. One more note. Um, Dr. Reese's book is for sale. Uh, I, uh, I am uh, planning on reading it myself. Mark has read it. Uh, there are a few others here who have uh, started to read it or have finished it. Um, it's for sale for $15 in the lobby, which is a discounted it's price. Cheaper than Amazon. Cheaper than Amazon. You heard it. And, uh, and, and that discounted price is thanks to our sponsors. So, um, and she will be signing if you want to uh, purchase the book and uh, talk to her a little more about it. Thank you. Good.